following is a sermon preached at Grace Church of Orange, California. Join us now as we go verse by verse through God's inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. Good morning. Well, Pastor Mike is up at a class at the Master Seminary uh, this week and next, and so I suppose you are stuck with me. We are going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, if you want to start heading there. And if you remember last week, uh, Pastor Mike was in Colossians chapter 3, talking about how central God's word is in helping us grow as believers. And so he and I are kind of tag teaming and hitting this from different angles. And so we're going to be talking about spiritual growth this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So as you get there, if you're able to stand, please do. And I'm going to read from chapter 3, verse 7 through 18. Paul here is talking about the old covenant that was given through Moses. And he says in verse 7, Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And Father, we ask that this morning you would uh, help us, help our minds to think clearly, help our hearts to respond rightly to the truth, reorient us to what is real and right and eternal. Give us an eternal perspective on all things, Lord. Shape us into the image of Christ. Let your word Rule in your church this morning. Let Christ rule in his church through his word. Lord, we pray this all for his honor and for his glory. Amen. Well, uh, I told first hour this. I didn't realize how um, poignant this intro might be after everyone just got ready and then drove to church. That can be a stressful time. And so the question I have for you after that is, do you ever notice that there's a gap between who you are and who you long to be, who you are and who God calls you to be? Do you ever notice that, that there is this knowledge of what we know to be true, what we know to be real, what we know to be what God calls us to be, and then there's where we actually live. There's what we actually say and do. Or maybe if you're a newer believer, a newer follower of Jesus, maybe you've wondered, how do I grow? How do I actually grow spiritually? maybe you've been a believer for a while and you can get discouraged or disheartened. You start to feel like, I've been fighting the same sins for years. I don't see any victory. I'm not going to see any victory. I'm just discouraged. Or something God has been sort of showing me recently. Have you ever noticed that that sometimes when we're saved, we get saved, we have these outward sins that everyone can kind of see. Uh, you can point to something and say, wow, that person got really angry, or, or something like this, visible to everyone. And then over time, God grows us, and, and we become more holy, and he, he teaches us, and you, those sins become less visible. Your life becomes pretty good for looking at it from the outside. But then sometimes God just kind of peels back the corner and just reminds us of what's really there under the surface in our heart, and those situations of life start to squeeze on us, and what comes out? It's not always pretty. It's, it's not always pretty at all. And so this, 
passage here today helps us. It helps us because it shows how this process of sanctification, of, of growing spiritually, how does it happen? How does it work? How does it function? And so that's really what we're going to be talking about this morning. And we're in this letter of 2 Corinthians. And I just want to give us a little bit of context because we're going to land in verse 18 and we're really going to stick there. But that, I don't want to just drop in there. That would be like turning on a movie 30 minutes in and then trying to figure out what's going on. So we need to get a little bit of a picture of what's happening here in 2 Corinthians. And uh, just at some point, go read 2 Corinthians if you hadn't in a while. It's so practical for today. Uh, what is essentially going on is that false teachers have come in and said, Paul, he looks weak. He says one thing, he does another, he doesn't follow through. How can you trust this guy? How can you trust his message? Are you really sure this whole new covenant thing is really what God wants? I don't think you can trust him. And the false teachers are just slandering him. And so he has to write this letter to come back and say, no, our, our word is reliable, our gospel is true, you can trust it. Corinthians, we love you. We didn't come visit you because we loved you. We wanted to give you time to grow and to repent. We want you to forgive the person who has wronged us. And he says all of these things to show that this gospel message that he proclaims, it's real, it's true, it works. And then you come to chapter three, and I just wanna quickly kind of run through what's going on here. At the beginning, he says, hey, so do we need the right papers, the right diplomas, the right documents, the right letters of recommendation? Is that what we need for you to trust us? Is that what proves that our ministry is, is valid? And he says, nope, you are. The gospels work in the people that Paul preached to. That's the proof that his ministry was real. Not some letters, not some recommendation from someone else, but the work that the gospel did in human hearts, that's the proof that the gospel really works. And then he moves on a little bit further, chapters kind of, or verses four, five, and six of chapter three, and he says, oh, and by the way, it was absolutely nothing about us. I wasn't clever. I wasn't a great visionary leader. I wasn't super gifted at preaching. It wasn't anything about me. It was the power of this gospel, this new covenant that I proclaim. And then he moves into explaining, so what is this new covenant? Why is it so great? And he talks about salvation and then sanctification. So starting kind of in verse seven here, just to walk up to our passage, he says that this old covenant was a ministry of death. And he references back to Exodus 34 with Moses. Now, if you remember, Moses goes up on the mountain. He receives the law from God. He speaks with God face to face. If you've read your Bible, maybe you remember this. And when he comes down, what, what does he have to do? What does Moses have to do? Cover his face. He doesn't realize it, but his face is shining. He has to cover it. And the language in that passage is, is actually purposefully echoing when the people say, don't let God speak to us lest we die. This is the idea. The old covenant, it was glorious. It was glorious, and it showed God's glory. It showed his holiness, but it revealed our sinfulness, and it was dangerous. Moses covers his face because it's a destroying glory. It's a glory that when sinners come in contact with it, bad things happen. Bad things happen. This is the, the old covenant reveals our sinfulness. And so Paul says in verse 7, this is the ministry of death carved in letters on stone. But it came with such glory that the Israelites can't even look at Moses' face. But that glory was being brought to an end. But this new covenant is different. It's different. It comes with more glory. Why? Well, first, because it's the, it's the ministry that gives life. It's not condemning. It gives life. And how does it do it? Verse 9, the ministry of condemnation had glory. But what is the new covenant? The ministry of righteousness. How does it give us life? It makes us right with God. This new covenant makes us right with God. This is what, what happens in salvation. And he goes on, kind of skipping down now to verse 12. He says, we have hope because of this, because the new covenant is life-giving. It gives us righteousness. Oh, I skipped verse 11. This is important. It's, it's not the covenant that's being brought to an end. It's permanent. It's not temporary. It's permanent. It will permanently rescue us because this message is trustworthy. It gives life. It makes us righteous. It lasts forever. And then he goes back to this analogy with Moses. And he says, 
just like Moses had to cover his face, in the same way, he's talking about the Jewish people in particular, when they read the Old Testament, there's still a veil that lies over their mind because their minds, verse 14, are hardened. They reject Jesus. Unbelievers reject him when they hear the truth of Scripture. And there's only one way that that, hap- that is removed. The Spirit removes that veil, helps us to see and to trust in Jesus and say, I love him, I trust him, I want to follow him. And when one turns to the Lord, verse 15, verse uh, 16, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. And when that happens, we are free. We have freedom from sin, freedom from condemnation. And that leads us up to our verse. So he's been talking about salvation, how salvation works, how the gospel works, how the new covenant works, why it's better than the old covenant. And now we come to verse 18. And what I want to do is walk through and just give you a number of, of points about spiritual growth, how it works, how it functions. Let me read verse 18, and then we're going to go phrase by phrase. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. All right, for you note takers, number one, spiritual growth is not optional. Spiritual growth is not optional. Look at that first phrase, and we all, you could also translate this, and every one of us. Whatever Paul's about to talk about, this is true of every single believer. And the reality is this. Your growth might be slow. It might be stop and start. It might feel like you're going one step forward and three steps back. But we will grow if we are believers. The Bible is very clear that there is no such thing as an entirely fruitless Christian. There is no such thing as someone who has no growth in holiness. I I hear this kind of scarily often. I, I've had someone say this to me even recently, that, you know, so-and-so, they, they prayed a prayer when they were four, they accepted Jesus, but then they've never been to church, never followed the Lord, never shown any passion for him, never pursued God at all, but I know they're saved because they prayed a prayer. That is nowhere in the Bible. That's, that's not Christianity. That's more like a magic spell that you say to get you into heaven. We don't, there's no prayer in the Bible that you pray to get saved. Salvation is about a trust, a loving trust, leaning itself entirely on Christ, and that produces a life that is changed. We are saved only by grace through faith. We are saved only by trusting in Jesus. That is alone what saves us. And yet, that type of faith that saves us always produces a changed life. Always produces. James is very clear about this. Philippians 2.13, Paul tells us to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. Hebrews tells us to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Our works don't earn any favor with God. Our works don't earn us any one step towards salvation. Our salvation is only because God is kind and gracious and merciful, and he does all of the work, and we are only saved by trusting in him, and yet that salvation always leads to a changed life. There is always the type of growth that we're going to be talking about today. Spiritual growth is not optional in the Christian life. That's number one. Number two, Spiritual growth is about the heart. Spiritual growth is about the heart. We are going to actually go, uh, in English, it comes out, they put a few uh, kind of phrases or clauses before the main verb of this sentence. But the main verb, if we wanted to read it straight, uh, kind of from the beginning to the main verb would be, and we all are being transformed. That is the main idea of this verse. We all are being transformed. And let me explain what I mean when I say spiritual growth is about the heart. The, I really like this, this definition from, uh, there's a, a dictionary that, that pastors use for, for certain Greek words, and this definition is excellent. This word transformed that Paul uses here is to change inwardly in fundamental character or condition. To change inwardly 
in fundamental character or condition. This is not about, we're not talking about just becoming a nicer person. We're not talking about behavior modification. Psychology can give you behavior modification. That's simple. You, you, can, be cha- you can change your behavior on your own. The transformation Paul is talking about here is heart level, what you love, what you desire, who you are at the deepest core. And what it is, is it is a passion for Christ. You all know unbelievers that are kind and nice and that do nice things for other people. You probably know unbelievers that are nicer than you are. I I, I do. (laughs) Nicer than me, not... (laughs) Just... But what we're talking about here is not simply niceness. We are talking about a fundamental heart attitude at the deepest level of your being that says, Christ is all. Christ is my treasure. Everything I do, everything I say, everything I think, it's for him. It's because of him. It's all about him. You don't know any unbelievers that can say that. What unbeliever do you know that says, yeah, I'm kind to people because I want to honor Jesus? That's a believer. And that's what only believers can say and do. This is a heart, deep level of transformation, a a change inwardly in our fundamental character that Jesus is bringing about. And and one reason I think this is so hope-giving, if you you notice, so many of of, uh, the sins that we struggle with are these momentary responses, sort of flash moments of things that happen in life. You're not calculating how you respond when you get cut off on the freeway. You don't sit and think about what to do when uh, someone, someone wrongs you or when um, you're under stress and harsh words come out against someone. That you, you're not sitting and calculating that the circumstances of life start to squeeze your heart and, and what comes out, what's in there is what comes out. It reveals our heart. And what's so encouraging is that it's really, it's really difficult, I think, to fight those momentary responses. Because in the moment, I don't have time to, to think through it. But God is about changing us at the level to where he transforms us to be the type of people who, when the pressure squeezes, what comes out of our heart is pleasing to him. It, it's the change at that fundamental level so that our flash responses are not anger or pride or a glance of lust, but but what honors the Lord, purity, kindness, graciousness. And so spiritual growth, it's not optional. It's about the heart level transformation. And number three, spiritual growth begins with saving faith. Spiritual growth begins with saving faith. If you look at our verse here, so far we've talked about, and we all, we are being transformed. The Lord is doing a work to fundamentally change our character. And then look at these next two phrases here is what we'll hit on. With unveiled face. Now, the analogy that Paul has just been making in the previous verses is that unbelievers, when they hear the gospel, when they read scripture, there's a veil over their understanding that keeps them from seeing that the gospel is true and that Jesus is king and that they want to love and follow him. So when he uses the phrase that we have unveiled faith, what he's saying is we do trust him. We do see that the gospel is true and right and and that Christ is worthy of our lives and that Christ has paid for our sin. And so the idea here when he says that we we are being transformed and that's happening as we look with unveiled face is that spiritual growth begins with saving faith. So let's talk about this for a moment. This is not a acceptance of facts. Saving faith is not knowing and accepting the reality that Jesus came to earth, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, rose from the dead. If you nod your head yes in acceptance of those facts, that does not translate into salvation. The demons nod their head yes to those facts. They know they happened. The difference, what saving faith is, is to say, yes, all those facts happened, and that's my king, and that's my Lord, and and my life is built on the rock of his words. Anytime, anyplace, anywhere, he tells me what to do, he tells me where to go, he is Lord, he is king, loving trust and submission. 
placing our life wholly on him. And you might have been dragged in here today. I don't know. Maybe you don't care a lick about what I'm saying. Maybe you've been here a long time and you're realizing I've kind of just been playing at this whole church thing, uh, playing with this whole Christianity thing. If you trust in Jesus right now, you will be saved. You'll have eternal life. You will be forgiven of your sin. This is the gospel that Paul preaches. This is the gospel that our church preaches. This is the gospel that we need. And even if you are a believer, your spiritual growth still starts here. And you can attest, if you've been a believer for a while, a lot of times the leaps that we take in our spiritual growth are those moments when we realize, I've been kind of half-hearted. I want want to completely devote myself to you, Lord. I want to really live in line with the fact that you are my king and that I've put my trust in you. And so saving, or spiritual growth begins with saving faith. We all, with unveiled face, are being transformed, and now we get to what I think is the money phrase in this passage. Number four, spiritual growth is about satisfaction. Spiritual growth is about satisfaction. And I'm going to need to to prove this to you, and to do it, we're going to look at the words in this phrase. Again, number four, spiritual growth is about satisfaction. Do you see that word there, beholding? You can kind of get what it means by thinking about two English words. The the general idea, if you say, I saw a car accident, generally what you would mean is sort of more broadly that, yeah, it it happened and I was aware of it. It has a different nuance if you say, I watched the car accident take place. That sort of gives you more of an idea of like, I, I was looking at it, I understood exactly what was going on, I saw this car hit this car, I watched it. Does that kind of make sense? Beholding here is more of the watching idea, not the seeing idea. It's whatever Paul's going to be talking about, whatever we're beholding, it is a a spiritual comprehension, understanding, valuing, grasping of something. It's getting it. We behold something. What do we behold? Look at the next phrase. The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. So, Verse, chapter 4, verse 4 clarifies this for us, but I'll just ask it as a question. I did this in first hour, and I'll try to make it easy. In whom does God most clearly display his glory? Jesus. And chapter 4, verse 4 tells us this, and it clarifies that when it's talking about beholding the glory of the Lord, that is most clearly seen in the person of Jesus. So we've got couple pieces going on here. We're, we're comprehending with our, you could call it our spiritual eyes. We're, we're seeing, we're understanding who this person of Jesus is. And in Jesus, we're seeing something. We're beholding something. It's his glory. Now, glory. What is, what is the Lord's glory? It's actually pretty simple. It's the sum of all of who God is. It's his value. It's his worth. The Hebrew word and the idea is if you put him in the scale, how much would he weigh? What would you have to put on the other side to balance them out? So when we, th- what this phrase is describing is that we all, let's just walk through the phrases. We all, all believers, every one of us, are trusting, unveiled face. We are trusting, leaning our entire lives on the Lord, and we are beholding, comprehending, seeing, understanding, valuing, treasuring all of who Jesus is, all of who God is as revealed in Jesus, all of his majesty, all of his uh, honor, his wisdom, his might, his power, his wrath, his justice, his patience, all of it. Now, let's dig further. There's more here. What Paul is describing, we can kind of helpfully shed some light on it by looking at other passages in the Bible. Deuteronomy 6. From way back in Deuteronomy, God says that he wants our heart. You shall what? Love. You shall love the Lord your God. He wants our heart. And the Bible describes sin often as a trade between what we love. This is why I use this word satisfaction. When you think of Jeremiah, he says that God is a fountain of living waters. He's talking about soul satisfaction there. And that the people have rejected that fountain of living waters and made their own little cisterns that can't hold any water the things of the world that can't satisfy you ultimately. Paul uses the same type of language to say that we, that um, sinful man exchanges the glory of God for the glory of created things. The core of sin is to say this uh, 
power that I want, this pride in my heart, uh, my own self, the, the love that I want from other people, whatever sin it is, that looks more satisfying, more enjoyable, more lovely, more desirable than God himself. That is the terrible exchange of sin, the insanity of sin. And Paul gives us one more principle kind of related to this. We'll tie them together. In Ephesians 4, he says, as believers, that whenever we want to put off sin, we also must put on righteousness. And the idea is this. God has so made us that our hearts don't like to have a vacuum. If you, you, let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, our hearts will always love and worship and treasure something. Jesus says no one can have two masters. He'll always serve something. You will always love and treasure something. You can't just put off sin without putting on something new in its place. And this brings us to a phrase that, that really changed my life as a teenager. And it's from a Puritan, and so it sounds old, but we have an explanation for it, so just give me a moment. This Puritan pastor talked about the expulsive power of a new affection. Let me explain this with an eating analogy. I don't, I am not a nutritionist. Don't take this advice actually, but it's a good analogy. If you decide I'm not going to, I'm going to eat healthy. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm not going to have any more sweets. No cake, no candy, no cookies, whatever else you like. And that's kind of your strategy. You'll find yourself at some point sitting at a table in front of a piece of cake or candy or cookie, or maybe it's even just in your mind you're thinking of it, and your stomach is empty and it's hungry and it wants that cake or that cookie. You've all been there, yes? <laughs> I've been there. But if you flip it and you decide, I'm going to fill my stomach with so much fruits and vegetables, and nowadays pick whatever healthy food. Everybody disagrees on what's healthy. So whatever healthy food you're into. I'm going to fill my stomach so much with that that you get to a point where you sit down in front of that cake or that cookie and you go, oh, I am so full. That looks, that looks disgusting. That exact same principle is how our soul works. What Paul is describing here is that when we see the glory of God revealed in Jesus, and we see all of who he is in his glory. And we, we, we want that. We treasure it. We see it as valuable. It, it fills us up and it pushes out. There's no more room for that sin that pulled on us. There's no more room for those other desires. You're, you're, the stomach of your soul, if you will, is full. We're satisfied in the Lord. Spiritual growth is about satisfaction. Where am I going to be satisfied? And so what Paul is describing is that as we see and comprehend and get who the Lord is and we treasure him and we value him as we ought, it forces out the desires that we have for sin. So spiritual growth, let me just walk back through these for us. Spiritual growth is not optional. Spiritual growth is about the heart. Spiritual growth is, uh-oh, uh I'm going to give you point five. Spiritual growth is, begins with saving faith. Spiritual growth is about satisfaction. And fifthly, spiritual growth is not about becoming a nice person. I, I mentioned this, um, and obviously kindness is a part of this, but let me just explain what I mean here. If you notice, it says, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, what are we being transformed into? The same image. Now, Again, a few verses later, Paul clarifies this to tell us that this image that we're being transformed into is the image of Jesus Christ. Paul says this again in Romans uh, 8. And so we know that God is molding and shaping and changing us to be like Christ. And that ultimately does not simply mean that he's changing us to be nice people. He's changing us to be people that are so consumed with a passion for God and a love for others that we... Our hearts overflow with the characteristics that define godliness. It's about a passion for God, and it's about reflecting all of the attributes that Jesus embodies. Love, peace, joy, kindness, courage, zeal, hatred of sin, and on and on and on, reflecting all of who he is. Spiritual growth is about reflecting him, not just about becoming a nicer person. Number six. Spiritual growth is hard work. 
Spiritual growth is hard work. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, and look at this next phrase, from one degree of glory to another. The, the theologian's term for this is progr progressive sanctification. The idea is this. Anyone here sit, sit down after you were saved and God zapped you and you've been perfect ever since? No. No. That, that is not how God has, has set up this life to work. In many places in Scripture, it makes it very clear. We've referenced some of them. Philippians 2.13, work out. You, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. Colossians 1.29, Paul says that, that he toils, he struggles with all the energy which God works in him. Hebrews, we already read this, it tells us strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I'm just gonna give you the next point because these two go hand in hand. Number seven is spiritual growth is a gift. Spiritual growth is hard work. Spiritual growth is a gift. Both, both are true. So uh, the analogy I like for this is uh, if you think about your home, you have a faucet. You can turn that faucet on and off. You can't make the water flow. I mean, the water company decides if you have water in your pipes or not. Hopefully you do. You can turn that faucet on and off. In the exact same way, not one ounce, not one drop of holiness will, can be generated by you yourself. God is the one that controls the water flow, and yet he's told us, and we'll get to this in a moment, he's told us through prayer, through encouragement from other believers, through reading the scriptures, those are like opening the faucet, and then we beg God to send the water. <laughs> And so in that analogy, the idea is that, that we, we strive, we long, we, we work, we plan, we put thought into growing as believers. And yet at the same time, we know not one drop of progress will be made unless he does the work, unless he gives us his power, his strength, and he works within us. So spiritual uh, growth is hard work. Spiritual growth is a gift. Lastly, oh, let me tell you where I got the idea that it's a gift from. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we have on the one hand that we're changed by degree by degree, we're, we're growing in holiness, but this all comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It's the Spirit that gives it. So, last thing here, and this comes from the context. We've walked through the actual verse, but you can tell by the context, and I'll show you in a moment, that Spiritual growth is fueled by truth. Spiritual growth is fueled by truth. In the context, Paul has been talking about what happens when unbelievers, specifically Jewish unbelievers, read the Old Covenant. He talks about when they... Let me find it here for you. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, covenant. And then in verse 15, to this day, whenever Moses is read. So in context, when he starts talking about beholding the Lord's glory, where do you think he's talking about that we find it? As we read scripture. Now what I want, the reason I said spiritual growth is fueled by truth and not simply by scripture is there's a couple points I want to make here. This book is not a magic book. Supernatural, amen. Powerful, amen. Stands forever, never to be controverted, amen. Perfect in every detail, amen. But you running your, your uh, eyes over the page without any understanding, does that make you holy? Does that zap you with holiness? It, again, it, it's not some magic incantation. The, the, there's a pastor I, I really appreciate that says that without understanding, this is just white pages and black ink. What changes us is the truth. It's that moment. I hope you've all had this. As you're reading, as you're studying, or as someone explains God's word, where you go, I got it. I get it. And oh my gosh, he's bigger than I realized. He's greater than I realized. He's stronger than I realized. He's more loving than I realized. That's, that's when we're changed. It's the truth of God's word that transforms us. And the reason I'm making a big point about this is because it opens endless possibilities. Here's what I mean. We know that we will not be changed apart from the truth. We will not be changed apart from the truth of God's word. And so 
Maybe you love reading. Good, read your Bible, study it, memorize it, meditate on it, talk to others about it, teach it, know it. But maybe you hate reading. Listen to it. Have someone read it to you. Have, you have a, maybe you have a phone that will read it to you. Or you can find it on the radio. Maybe you can get it where you only have to read it a few times and then you memorize it and you speak it to yourself and you meditate on it and you know it and you let the truth sink in that way. But the horizons are very broad on this. Listen to this. God's word and the truth of it, he's revealed that to other believers too, right? Other believers read God's word and they know more than we do. They understand it better than we do. And a lot of those believers are dead. But guess what? They wrote so we can learn the truth of God's word in books. Read books about theology. Read books about God and who he is. Read books about the Christian life, how to be a godly employee, how to be a godly mom or father or man or woman. Listen to sermons. Listen to lectures on scripture. Listen to music that sings biblical truth. If you're into poetry, listen to poetry that comes from a biblical worldview. Watch movies. Watch videos that apply God's word to all of life. I think about um, YouTube and the avenue that that is, if you've heard of the Bible Project, they put out these awesome videos that explain uh, God's word. Talk with living believers. That's what we're supposed to be for one another. And if you really think about it, that's really the only thing we have to offer one another. Ultimately, the help believers give to one another is taking some portion of the truth of God's word, putting that into practice in real life, and either encouraging one another with it, uh, rebuking at times one another with it, just... Uh, reminding one another of it, praying together. It's always the truth that fuels all growth, but it comes from all these different angles and avenues. And so we as believers ought to be voracious for the truth because that's where we see God's glory revealed. And that's when we have a new desire that pushes out those old desires and we become transformed. Does that all make sense? And so just... Wrapping up as we move into bread and cup together, um, into com taking communion together, my, my hope and my prayer for us this year and, and really every year is that we would pursue this type of spiritual growth, that we would be completely dependent on the Lord and at the same time we would strive for holiness and that God in his grace would make us people who, who show Christ to the world by how we live, who are genuinely saved, who have real faith. That's my prayer for us. And so may that be so, may that be true among us. And let's, let's move now to, to take communion together. Thanks for listening. For more information about Grace, please visit our website at graceorange.org.